Will they even come to class if everything is recorded? Automated lecture capture seems to disincentivize attendance, and naturally there is tension between students and teachers on this point all across the world. Every university or college is thinking about how to compete in this online space, and institutions with billions of dollars in endowments can afford to experiment with this at the highest levels. If it's your first time here, my name is Jack Quang, and on this channel we talk about science, teaching, and careers. This is part two in our ongoing series talking about university teaching in the Australian context and more specifically how it's changed over time in the online teaching and learning space. The previous chapter talked about phase one, if it ain't broke, and phase two, the tipping point. One thing I want you to keep an eye on today is MOOCs. MOOCs are of course massive open online courses and when you look at the marketplace, it's a very crowded marketplace of MOOCs with the big players, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, UC Berkeley, they have an enormous head start, very, very incredible looking online courses. Is it worth it for my institution, my university, my college, or indeed myself as an individual teacher to learn how to make online courses and online learning work? We'll come back to the answer to this question at the end of this video. Phase three, the revolution will be televised from 2005 to about 2010. Automated lecture capture systems became in vogue just before 2010 ever really went away. Sure, we want students to attend classes live because study after study shows that there is more productive and conducive learning environments to coming to class than watching things online. The challenge for teachers is to create learning experiences that are more compelling than automated lecture recordings of a computer screen and a static filled audio feed. What value do students get from actually coming to class? There are no easy answers here and attending class will always come second to students working to pay their bills or fulfilling their family or carer duties. Opening a conversation with your students about attendance right at the start of the semester is a good approach. Phase four, MOOCs, MOOCs, MOOCs. From 2010 to 2015. MOOCs or massively open online courses started upscaling in their global reach. Ironically, the attended audience for MOOCs Students who have never studied or experienced higher education before benefit the least from MOOCs. The high dropout rate for MOOCs has been well documented. It is in fact us, teachers and other professional learners with one degree or qualification under our belt who have the skills and motivation to get the most out of MOOCs because we can propel our own independent learning. These early MOOCs have served as the prototype for how online learning is done today. Graphics, animations, videos, voiceover, a range of high quality multimedia resources that teachers typically don't know how to create by ourselves. Now let's circle back to the question posed at the beginning of the video. Is it worth it for institutions and individual teachers to get into this space and learn how to make these online courses? Can a new online course have the same learning outcomes for students as one of the more established online courses? Yes, definitely. Textbooks and the resources used in these online courses are available to anyone and you could use the same readings, the same diagrams as any of the teachers at the big universities and set that same learning activity. As it relates to assessment, assessment design should be pretty transparent. So if you can't find that type of assessment from the big universities, you can look at any of the more open universities with respect to how they publish their course or subject details. So I think the learning outcome piece of it is pretty equivalent as long as you've got the right pedagogies and learning design in place. Can we rival the production quality of the courses that are more established? And if you look into the literature and you look at the work of a very prolific cognitive psychologist Richard E. Mayer. Him and his colleagues have been working in the space of the multimedia theory of learning for decades. And there is one design principle that they've authored called the seductive details principle. A very visually appealing or striking image or animation of video. On its face value, the perception is that this is an amazing piece of work that students would really benefit from. But when you come to measure student learning in response to that amazing piece of visual wizardry, it doesn't necessarily improve their learning outcomes. It just improves their perception of the product that they're experiencing. The production quality plays a part in the perception, but really it doesn't play a dramatic role in the performance or the impact it may have on student learning. Now that doesn't mean that production quality doesn't matter because indeed perception is reality and it's a crowded marketplace. Students will flock to the product they think has the highest quality. Individual teachers need to upskill. Yes, but they can't do so without the support of their institution, either through learning designers or the equipment and the expertise to get this online product looking and sounding as good as possible. So that still doesn't answer the question. What will make it worth an institution's while to invest the resources to look 
and sound as good as they can in the online course space. I think you could pick a couple of courses that are very strategically valuable to your institution. Let's say a large first year course that every single student might do or a course that's a prerequisite as an entrance exam for certain language competencies as an example. And you can invest your resources there and make the online learning as visible and as high quality as possible. And once you've invested the resources, the equipment, the personnel to make that happen, there are natural crossover events into how it impacts teaching across your entire institution. And it could be as simple as building a studio space for teachers coming in to record their pieces to camera or their voiceovers or their animations. And when you build that space, doesn't mean the space disappears after that's done. It could be available for other strategic initiatives after that point. And you can see and measure the return on investment after you've made that first big strategic online course. From the individual teacher's perspective, it's a different story because you may or may not get access to that institutional support straight away. It could be as simple as drawing your own diagrams and not being at the mercy of textbook publishers updating their figures every every single year, all the way to recording podcasts or videos tailored for your students to create that sense of an individualized learning experience. My audience or my students, they reside and they spend most of the time on the different social media platforms. So I learned how to communicate through those various media. And as a result, I've become a more effective communicator, I believe, in the online space. Once I'm invested in that skill set, and that includes video, audio, it has had that same crossover effect into other domains of my academic activity and academic performance. Looking and sounding good in my classes made it very easy for me to look and sound good in online conference presentations. Every performance appraisal, promotion application, or job interview process I've been involved with for the past three years has been online. And so looking and sounding good in that avenue, again, makes you stand out quite a lot. So it has real value for you as the individual. How should you go about learning these skills? Well, it just so happens to be another ripple effect of the MOOC movement. The internet is flooded with free online courses teaching you how to do everything especially in the creative industries. A quick YouTube search will show you how to use any of the programs that content creators rely on to animate, edit, and publish their work online. And these are all designed to be small, digestible chapters for you to work through at your own pace. So as teachers, we should take advantage of these free resources. That concludes chapter two of our ongoing discussion about university teaching and how it's changed over the past 20 years. The next chapter will conclude the series talking about the final three phases. You can indeed find the links to all the chapters as well as the full discussion in the links below. Hope that was helpful. This is the Bilab Collective. I'm Jack Wayne. See you next time.